because God hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Brothers and sisters, young people, friends, this world is going to be judged by God. He made it and it's his purpose to cleanse it and ultimately to fill it with his glory when the wicked shall have been judged and sin has been punished. But that judgment will not be accomplished in a moment. It will be poured out, I believe, in seven stages. And isn't it interesting that in Revelation chapter 6, there are seven seals. In Revelation 8 and 9, there are seven trumpets. In Revelation 16, there are seven vials of the wrath of God which are poured out upon the earth. And just harking back to something Brother Don said, all of those judgments, the seals, the trumpets, and the vials, were against various manifestations of Rome. The pagan Roman Empire, the Christian Roman Empire in the East and the West, and finally, the Holy Roman Empire, overthrown. And of course, there is another series of seven in Revelation. It's in Revelation chapter 10, the seven thunders, which John was commanded not to write. I leave you to speculate as we go through these seven forthcoming judgments, whether they are or not the seven thunders. So there are seven stages of God's judgment to come. The first is the judgment of the saints. And that's going to be our focus in this session. Then comes the judgment of Israel in the land. Brother Don has shown very clearly that they are divided between secular and religious Jews. There are those who revere the word of God and are looking for the coming of Messiah. And there are those who are participating in the sin of Sodom and other evils. And Zechariah chapter 13 and Ezekiel chapter 38 tell us that God is going to use Gog to judge them just as he used Babylon in the past. And two thirds of them are going to be wiped out in that judgment. Then, number three, comes the judgment on Gog and his allies, as detailed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Daniel chapter 11. Once Gog has been put out of the way, then will come the judgment on the rest of the Jews. The stick of Ephraim of Ezekiel 37 and Ezekiel 20 de details how they are going to be brought into the wilderness and God is going to plead with them face to face as he pleaded with their fathers in the wilderness of Egypt. He's going to purge out from among them the rebels and those that transgress against him. And he's going to bring the faithful into the bond of the covenant. And they and they only are going to be brought into the land of Israel. And the two sticks of Ezekiel 37 are going to be joined together. And then follows the judgment of the Gentile nations. Daniel chapter 7 and Matthew 25, when the Lord Jesus Christ sits on the throne of his glory, and he won't do that until he has first sat on his judgment seat and judged the saints. When the Lord Jesus stands on the throne of his, sits on the throne of his glory, and all nations, all ethnos are gathered before him, he will separate them as the shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And the standard of that judgment will be the attitude of the nations toward the nation of Israel. And Brother Don's already highlighted a significant difference in the attitude of Britain and France and Germany towards the Iran situation to that of other nations. How have you treated my brethren, the Lord Jesus will ask. And then once the nations have been judged, the fourth beast has been slain and his body delivered to the, the burning flame. And the other nations have had their dominion taken away. The Lord Jesus Christ will reign over the earth and rule over the earth for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, as Revelation 20 tells us, there will be an uprising of the flesh against the righteous judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will compass the camp of the saints and the beloved city. 
and fire will come down from heaven and destroy them. And then finally, the great white throne <coughs> judgment at the end of the thousand years, Revelation 20, verse 11 onwards, when those who have died during millennial rule of Christ and those who are alive at the end of it will be gathered together and judged according to those things which are written in the books. And then death and the grave will be cast into the lake of fire and God will be all and in all. That's the future that scripture outlines for us. The thing we need to focus on, brothers and sisters, is that we will be the subject of the first of those judgments. We won't see any of the others as more, with mortal eyes. Suddenly, we will be called to the judgment seat of our Lord. Luke chapter 17. Here are the words of the judge. Luke chapter 17 and verse 26. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all, because it was a universal flood. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. The same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. He that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. And Luke 21, the Olivet Prophecy, and verse 34. <coughs> This is clearly future. Luke 21, 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, just as the people were in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. So that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And that is our lot, brothers and sisters, to stand before the Son of Man. Now I believe there is no doubt at all that we will be the first to be judged. Come with me to the first epistle of Peter and chapter 4. First Peter 4 and verse 17. First Peter 4 verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And we are the house of God. We are the spiritual temple in which God desires to dwell. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? There's the scriptural evidence. And I believe there is an Old Testament basis for 1 Peter 4 verse 17. Because begin at the house of God is a quotation from the passage which Brother Todd just read to us from Ezekiel and chapter 9. I wonder if you noticed it. Let's go there. Ezekiel chapter 9 details the outpouring of the judgments of God upon wicked Israel right at the end of the time of the kingdom, the reign of Zedekiah, the days of Ezekiel's prophecy. But what's the context of Ezekiel chapter 9? 
We'll come back to chapter 8, verse 1. It came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifteenth, fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord Yahweh fell there upon me. Verse 3, he put forth the form of an hand and took me by a lock of mine head. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north. Ezekiel in vision is picked up by a lock of his hair and taken to Jerusalem and set down in the temple by the north gate. And he was shown the abominations which were done in the temple. So middle of verse 3. Where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoketh to jealousy? And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain, the cherubic chariot bearing the manifestation of the glory of God. And then he said unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes by the way that looked toward the north. And behold, northward at the gate of the altar was this image of jealousy in the entry. <clears throat> there was some idol in the temple which provoked God. Keep your finger in Ezekiel and come back to Exodus and chapter 20. Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, and we go in at verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, nor any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, until the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. That's what's being manifest in the temple in Ezekiel chapter 8. An image which roused God's jealousy because they were worshipping it rather than him. So, brothers and sisters, young people, we need to examine ourselves. What images, literal or electronic, do we have hidden away? Verse 7. And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. What's on our walls, brothers and sisters? What wallpaper do we have on our laptop or computer? I must admit on one occasion when a brother was lecturing at Coventry West and he set up his laptop, I was rather amazed and not a little horrified at his screensaver. It wasn't a pleasant sight at all, not in accordance with the things that we believe. So what have we got? on our walls. Verse 11. There stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. In the midst of them stood Jeazaniah the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? every man in the chambers of his imagery. But they say, Yahweh seeth us not. Yahweh hath forsaken the earth. So what do we do, brothers and sisters, in the dark? Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, let the lamps of God go out. And in the darkness they lay with the women who assembled by troops at the door of the tabernacle. Keep your finger in Ezekiel and come forward to John chapter 3. And here's the discrimination of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Genesis 1 we read that God said let there be light and there was light and God saw the light that it was good and that is the concept that we have all the way through scripture but in John chapter 3 and verse 19 we read the words of our Lord Jesus Christ this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil but every one that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved but he that doeth truth truth is something to be lived not just to be believed he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God so which category are we in there are only two light dark spirit flesh good evil and so forth back to Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 13 he said also unto me turn thee again and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do then brought he then he brought me to the door of the gate of Yahweh's house which was toward the north and there behold sat women weeping for Tammuz Tammuz was a Phoenician fertility god and the belief among the pagans was that he died annually and then was resurrected so this would appear to be the period when he was believed to be dead and the women were weeping for him verse 15 then said he unto me hast thou seen this O son of man turn thee yet again and thou shalt see greater abominations than these and he brought me into the inner court of Yahweh's house and behold at the door of the temple of Yahweh between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of Yahweh and their faces toward the east and they worshipped the sun toward the east then said he unto me hast thou seen this O son of man is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here for they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger and lo they put the branch to their nose therefore will I also deal in fury mine eye shall not spare neither will I have pity and though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice yet will I not hear them 25 men the high priest and the 24 heads of the courses of the priesthood and they've turned their backs on God and are worshipping the son which he created instead of praying to Yahweh come with me to Jeremiah in chapter 2 <coughs> Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 26 Jeremiah 2 verse 26 as the thief is ashamed when he is found so is the house of Israel ashamed they their kings their princes their priests and their prophets saying to a stock thou art my father and to a stone thou hast brought me forth for they have turned their back unto me and not their face but in the time of their trouble they will say arise and save us but where are the gods that thou hast made thee let them arise if they can save thee in the time of trouble for according to the number of thy cities are thy gods O Judah and this world is full of gods but the people of this world worship and we need to beware that we're not caught up with all that but we keep ourselves separate that we don't spiritually turn our backs upon God and face the world because we know that friendship with the world is enmity with God and so we turn the page to Ezekiel chapter 9 and here I believe is the prototype for 1 Peter chapter 4 and the man with the writer's inkhorn was told in verse 4 to set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof, the abominations that Ezekiel had seen as recorded in chapter 8 
So he set a mark upon their foreheads, and the rest were slain. So that begs the question, brothers and sisters, are we sighing and crying for all the abominations that are done both in the world and sadly in our community? Does it grieve us? Turn with me to the second epistle of Peter and chapter 2. <clears throat> Here we have an example, a role model for us in this evil generation. <clears throat> We've already read in Luke about Jesus paralleling the time of his coming to the time of Sodom. So 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. The word vexed in verse 7 means to be oppressed. It's used of the Israelites who were oppressed in Egypt before God, by the hand of Moses, brought them out. But the word vexed in verse 8 is a much stronger word. It means tormented. It's used in Revelation chapter 9 of the way that the Saracens tormented the Catholics. So the Catholics sought death and desired it and couldn't find it. That's how Lot felt about the world in which he lived. And the world in which we live is very similar to that world. So are we vexing our souls with the unlawful deeds and the filthy conversation of the wicked around us? Come to Revelation and chapter 7. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1. After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their forehead. And that comes straight out of Ezekiel chapter 9 as well. Yahweh knows who are his, and he will not judge the world until they are safe. So how do we compare with the righteous ones we've thought about? Are we sighing and crying? Are we vexed with iniquity? And when the men with the slaughter weapons went through Jerusalem and began at the house of God, Ezekiel realised that he was not slain. He was spared. He fell on his face before God. What a lesson for us. Come now to the book of Nehemiah in chapter 10. As we look at another example of a past judgment, which has lessons for us as things project forward. Because Nehemiah is an amazing type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Twice over, he's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in his first coming, when he came to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Is that part of our motivation in the truth and in the ecclesia to seek the welfare of our brothers and sisters? In Nehemiah chapter 10, <clears throat> they made a covenant. They promised to do certain things in the service of God and of his temple and in remaining separate from the evils of the world around them. Think about what we have promised to do, to remain separate from the world around us and the things that we have promised to do for the Lord our God. And then Nehemiah left them. And then he came back again suddenly. Uh, and it's impossible from the scriptures to calculate the date of the return of Nehemiah, just as it is impossible for us to calculate the second coming of Jesus Christ. And when he came, 
He came to fulfill Malachi's prophecy. The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, but who shall stand when he appeareth? And in Nehemiah chapter 13, we find they'd broken at least seven of the ten aspects of the covenant that they had made in chapter 10. And Nehemiah came and he stopped the evil. He reinstated that which was right and he drove sinners from his presence. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes, so we'll say to son, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And all these scriptures, brothers and sisters, young people, should help and encourage us to walk uprightly in however few or many days there remain. <clears throat> because the call will come, the call to Sinai. Turn back with me to the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 33. And here's the blessing of Moses wherewith he blessed the people just before he died. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 1. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, Yahweh came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints from his right hand went a fiery law for them yea he loved the people all his saints are in thy hand and they sat down at thy feet every one shall receive of thy, 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 of thy words that's a prophecy those words have not yet been fulfilled since the day that moses spake them to the children of israel there's another prophecy like that in psalm 68 Psalm 68 and verse 17. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in the holy place. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also. That Yahweh God might dwell among them. And here's another future prophecy. Because those words are quoted, verse 18, are quoted in Ephesians chapter 4 of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, ascending on high, leading captivity captive, and giving spirit gifts to men. Verse 17 says, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. But it's not the normal Hebrew word for angels. It's not Malak. It is Sinan, the changed ones. And those changed ones will receive gifts from men. And Yahweh will dwell among them. And they will go, as we shall see, with the Lord Jesus Christ to do his work with him. Come on a bit further now to Isaiah and chapter 63. As we put together, as it were, the jigsaw pieces, that scripture provides us about this judgment at Sinai. Isaiah 63 and verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom, with dyed garments from Bosra? This that is glorious in his apparel, travelling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone. Of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon all my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Those verses, those later verses, are really the provenance of Brother Mike. But it's clear 
that the Lord Jesus Christ comes from the south, from Edom and from Bosra, and he comes to judge the nations. I will tread down the people, the Goyim, in my anger. And then, of course, we have Zechariah 14 and verse 5, well known, I'm sure, to most of us here. <clears throat> The time when God gathers the nations against Jerusalem to battle in verse 2. And the city is taken and the houses rifled and the women ravished. That's exactly what Hamas has been doing in southern Israel. The half of the city shall go forth into captivity and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall Yahweh go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle because they will reach the point where the IDF cannot save them. America cannot rescue them. It's only Yahweh who will save them. And verse 4, His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains. For the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah. And Yahweh my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. When the Lord Jesus Christ arrives in Jerusalem, all the saints will be with him, already judged at Mount Sinai. There will be a judgment at Jerusalem, but it will be of the nations and not the saints. Matthew 25, before him shall be gathered all nations and <coughs> shall separate them as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And Zechariah 14 verse 5 is a New Testament echo from Ezekiel and chapter 43. When Ezekiel in the midst of that marvelous vision which he was given of the temple of the future age tells us in verse 40 verse 1 of ezekiel 43 afterward he brought me to the gate even the gate that looketh to the east and behold the glory of the god of israel came from the way of the east and the voice was like the noise of many waters and the earth shined with his glory and it was according to the appearance of the vision which i saw even according to the vision that i saw when i came to destroy the city that's chapter 8 and 9. And the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Kibar. That's Ezekiel chapter 1. And the glory of Yahweh came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. And that's the direction Zechariah 14 says, Christ and the saints are going to come through. And behold, the glory of Yahweh filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house. And the man stood by me. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne, the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. In my holy name shall the house of Israel but no more defile, neither they nor their kings, by their whoredom, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. Christ and the saints enthroned in Jerusalem. And this glory, Ezekiel says, it's like the glory that he saw by the river Kibar, which is detailed in chapter 1. It's the cherubim. Now, if you turn with me to Revelation chapter 5, we have there a passage which tells us very clearly that the cherubim are a symbolic representation of the saints. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8. When the Lamb had taken the book, the, the book with the seven seals, when the Lamb had taken the book, the four living creatures and the four and twenty elders, whom John had seen in the vision in chapter 4, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of incense, it's, it's the normal Greek word for incense there, which are the prayers of saints. And they, and they are the four living creatures, and the four and twenty elders. 
And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So there's the connection between the, the cherubim and the saints. It is the four living creatures and the four and twenty elders who sing the words of Revelation 5 verses 9 and 10 about themselves. Unless you are reading a modern version, which is very different. Because there are one or two fourth century Greek manuscripts, corrupt manuscripts, which leave out the word us from verse 9 and verse 10. They have to put something in, so they put in the word men. Thou hast redeemed men by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and made them unto our God kings and priests. So it breaks the connection between the saints and the cherubim. But the vast majority, vast, vast majority of Greek manuscripts, the word us is there. And the connection is there between the four beasts, the four living creatures and the saints. Let's go to Habakkuk chapter 3 now. Brother Mike's going to deal with the latter part of this chapter, but let's just have a look at the beginning of it. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 1. The prayer of Habakkuk the prophet upon Shigionoth. O Yahweh, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. <clears throat> o Yahweh, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known. In wrath remember mercy. God came from Timan, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. Now that word Holy One there in verse 3 is the Hebrew word Kodesh. And seven times, sorry, nine times in the Old Testament, it is translated saints. We've already seen it in Deuteronomy 33, verse 3, and in Zechariah 14, verse 5. It's also translated saints in Job chapter 5, verse 1. In Job 15, verse 15. In Psalm 16, verse 3. In Psalm 34, and the verse has dropped off the edge of my printing. Anyone wants to know where it is, come and see me afterwards, we'll find it. Uh, Psalm 89, verses 5 and 7, and Hosea chapter 11, verse 11. So it is the saints who come from Mount Paran and from Tima. Judgment of the saints is at Sinai. It is there to there that we shall be called. But when we get there, brothers and sisters, what is going to be the basis of the judgment? What is the judge looking for in us? There are two New, Te New Testament passages which speak of the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema. And the first of them is in Romans chapter 14 and verse 10. Romans 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And First Peter says the same thing. We will have to give account. And the other uh, judgment seat passage is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
that everyone may receive the things done in body according to that he hath done, whether good or bad. So Romans tells us we've got to give account, and Corinthians tells us there will be a response from the Lord, and he will give according as he determined. So what's the basis of the judgment? What are the criteria on which it is based? Come with me to the Gospel of John and chapter 12. The Gospel of John, of course, is the Gospel of Jesus as the judge. It abounds in verdicts. So far I've found over 60 verdicts of the Lord Jesus Christ, 20 by the Jewish rulers and, and a dozen by the people. So here's Jesus in John 12 and verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So what's our attitude to the word? If we hear it, we are responsible. That's what happened when Paul talked to Felix, the governor. He reasoned with Felix of righteousness, temperance and judgment to come. And Felix was an unrighteous and intemperate man. And, and the literal Greek is that Felix was terrified and sent Paul away because Paul, by his preaching of the word, had made Felix responsible. So the word will judge. We've heard it. We have a responsibility to act upon what we have heard. Now come to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 35. A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good things, and an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words shalt thou shalt be condemned. And here's that word account again that we met in Romans 14. We have to give account in words and on the basis of what we say. We are either justified, counted righteous, or we shall be condemned. Every idle word. What's the significance of that? Well, come to 1 Timothy and chapter 5. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 5 is an amazing chapter. Uh, it draws a picture by the, the Spirit of two sisters in the Ecclesia. It's not comparing a sister in the Ecclesia with a woman in the world. It's comparing two sisters in the Ecclesia. And there are eight points of correspondence or antithesis between the two. If anyone wants a copy of that list, come and see me afterwards and I will email it to you. But in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 13, um, let's go back a bit, verse 11. The younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation, because they have cast off their first faith. <clears throat> and with all they learn to be idle, that's the word, wandering around from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking of those things which they ought not. They're behaving like worldlings. They're learning to be idle. And over a page to Titus chapter 1, and verse 12. Titus chapter 1, and verse 12. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, idle bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. So there's a serious warning there. Come on a little further to Second Peter and chapter 1. Another, another occurrence of this word. Second Peter chapter 1 
and verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall be neither idle nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Idle means to be barren. No fruit. We know what the scriptures say about that. So if we don't want to be barren, if we don't want to be accounted as idle, then we've got to work on the things that are listed from verses 5 to 7. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godly, godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness agape. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall not be idle or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And one more, Romans chapter 2. Here's another passage about the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this subject is really a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle. You've got to find all the pieces and put them together. So Romans chapter 2, and we'll go in at the end of verse 5 which talks about the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing, God will give, sorry, those patience in well-doing, seek for glory and honour and immortality, God will give eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, God will give indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. So there's our template, as it were. Are we patiently continuing in well-doing? Are we seeking for glory and honour and immortality? Or are we contentious and don't obey the truth? We need to examine ourselves in whatever time there is that remains. Come now to another judgment picture, Revelation chapter 15, 16. <clears throat> this is one of those relatively few places in the scriptures where you can draw a red line or whatever color line you use to represent the Lord Jesus Christ between two verses and say, at this point, Jesus returns. And it's there in Revelation 16, between verses 14 and 15. In verse 14, we've got the spirits of demons who gather the nations to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And as Brother Don has shown, we can see that happening. The nations gather at New York and the United Nations, and again and again and again they condemn Israel. <coughs> gathering the nations to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And then, verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And I believe there's an Old Testament basis for this. It's in Exodus 32, where Moses has gone up the mount to talk to God, and Joshua has gone up with him, and Joshua is as high up the mount as God will allow him to go. And Joshua's eyes are upward, he's focused, he's looking, waiting, watching for his Lord Moses to come down from the presence of God, just as we should be looking, watching, waiting for our Lord Jesus Christ to come. And Joshua is fully clothed, down on the plain. Members of the Ecclesia are, are dancing naked around the golden calf. We know it's the Ecclesia because Stephen tells us so in, in Acts chapter 7. They were the Ecclesia in the wilderness. And they're types of us, says 1 Corinthians 10. And they're dancing naked round the golden calf. And Moses said, when he came, suddenly, unexpectedly, as for this Moses, we want not what has become of him. And suddenly he was at the gate of the camp. Who is on Yahweh's side? What would we do? How would we react? Would we be prepared to go and slay? Just like Ezekiel 9, isn't it? Go and slay everyone who doesn't have the mark. And so they did. 
First Thessalonians in chapter 5. We, we need to be reassured in our minds of the attitude of our Heavenly Father towards us who must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, echoes back to Brother Don, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Remember the words of Jesus in John chapter 3. Men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. But every man that doeth truth cometh to the light. Verse 6, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for the helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as ye also do. That's what God wants us to do. Comfort one another, edify one another, knowing that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that Jesus offered that sacrifice to take away our sins. In James chapter 5, we have another exhortation. <clears throat> James chapter 5 and verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not against one another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Look at commanded to marry the very opposite sort of person, sort of young lady that he might have wanted to marry. And all that he had to endure until eventually she came back. Look at Jeremiah. Words were despised. It was cast into the Mari dungeon. Look at Ezekiel. He was struck dumb unless God spoke through him, even through the period when his wife died. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful of tender mercy. Think about Job, the way God dealt with him, and ultimately restored him to twice as much as he had before. Let's go finally now to the very last chapter of the Scriptures, Revelation 22. <clears throat> the time of the judgment is coming. And the exhortation of our Lord, almost his very final exhortation is, be ready. Revelation 22, verse 10. He saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, 
the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And then there follows in verse 14, a marvelous picture, which is the antithesis of Genesis chapter three. Because in Genesis chapter three, we have a man who hearkened to the voice of his wife and did not do God's commandment, who was debarred from eating of the tree of life and could not enter in through the gate into the garden because of the cherubim and the flaming sword. Here now in Revelation 4, 22 verse 14, we have not just one man but a multitude who do God's commandments and are given right to the tree of life and are allowed to enter into, through the gates into the city where there is no need of the sun or the moon, the glory of God and the Lamb or the light thereof. And they, hopefully we, the flesh, just like Adam, but it is possible to subdue the flesh with the help of the word of God and to do God's commandments to the extent that we will be given right to the tree of life. So the exhortation of our Lord Jesus Christ is to be ready that we might be recognized as having done his commandments, which are not grievous, says the apostle, and given access to the tree of life and entrance into that wonderful city.